body of phantoms and monsters. They exist among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another Phantoms and Monsters Personal Reports, where I narrate, discuss some of the cryptid and unexplained sightings and encounters submitted to me at Phantoms and Monsters and the Phantoms and Monsters Report Team Research Team. So thanks for joining me. <clears throat> now, the uh, Phantoms and Monsters radio channel is made possible by you clicking on the subscribe and like buttons and by you sharing our programming. Uh, super chat and super thanks donations are appreciated. Uh, you can click the dollar icon located in the chat box and the um, buy me a coffee link is also available. So thanks for your consideration. Now, uh, if you're in the chat and have a question, please use all caps. And I'll try to get to each and every one after my presentation. And I'll let you know when I'm on the last, the last account so that you can start posting your questions in the chat room. So tonight, we're going to do a little bit different. Uh, no cryptids per se, but there may be a few that get mixed in with these um, glitches in the matrix, which can be defined as an event that occurred in the universe that shouldn't have been manifested based on uh, previously established rules. Uh, the phrase was first coined in 1999 in the film, The Matrix, and uh, with the idea that humanity is living in a giant computer simulation, but in terms of the paranormal, it's kind of a catchphrase for a witnessed event that cannot be explained with critical thinking. Uh, the explanations for the incidents uh, described in this presentation are left to the listener to determine. So I suggest that each of you keep an open mind and formulate your, uh, your interpretations. I will present the reports in detail and attempt to answer questions from the chat. So uh, this first account is where a college stu student in rural Pennsylvania experiences an apparent alien encounter. But many years later, he receives a package that contains items that went missing on the night of the abduction. This is a really strange one. I got this, I get this account a while back. I, I recently reposted it on the blog, but uh, it's pretty weird. Uh, so it starts off, hello, Mr. Strickler. I was referred to your site by my grandson after I mentioned an incident I had in 1958 when I was a young man going to college at Mount Alto, Pennsylvania. It was late evening and I was in my room sitting in a lounge chair trying to read and stay awake at the same time. I was near graduation and had a lot of things on my mind. Now, as I sat there, I had a strange feeling like someone was watching me and I became very restless. After a few minutes, I sensed that something was on the other side of the closed door to my room. I, I still can't explain it. So I got up in the chair and uh, I went to the door, opened it a bit and looked out. There were two men dressed in black suits, sunglasses, and a black and black fedora hats. They looked like identical twins. They were dark complexioned with Asian eyes, but they weren't Asian. So as I stood there, 
They didn't say a word, but I knew that they were talking to me through my mind saying, are you ready? For some unknown reason, I knew deep down what they were referring to. I was shirtless with only a pair of shorts, so I reached for a jacket. That will not be necessary. No one will see you, is what they told me. The three of us walked out into the hallway, and suddenly we were standing on a small hill behind the student hall. I noticed the headlights of a car coming down the street and ducked behind the two men. I heard them laughing at me in my mind. We told you no one would see you. I was scared and turned away for a minute, wondering if I should run. I thought better of it, turned to say something to them and noticed that they were looking up. I followed their gaze and realized that something was suspended above us. I continued to look when an opening appeared in its center and blue white light came tumbling out of it. I started to feel dizzy and a bit nauseous like when you are on a roller coaster or airplane that is dropping too fast. Then I realized we were floating up toward whatever the object was. I must have fainted because I only remember that I was lying on my side when I woke. I got up and looked around. The entire room was empty except for the small table on which I was sitting. The room was bathed in a soft glow, but had no apparent light source that I could see. Then I heard a female voice say, he's awake. I looked around to see if I could see anyone, but saw nothing. About this time on the floor wall, a door appeared and opened. Although the hallway was dark, there was a bluish white illumination that appeared as though it was materializing. Two shadows seemed to move across the doorway, but I couldn't tell anything about the shapes. I received a mental image of two people approaching, one carrying a tray full of some kind of surgical instruments and syringes. Then I went blank. My next memory was of being back in my room and in my chair reading. I got up and felt like I had just woken up from a deep dream or deep sleep. Then I noticed several items were missing, including three books and a framed photo of my parents. Now, I have never had any effects that I know of from my experience, though I have had a remarkably healthy life. As well, I am constantly told I look 20 years younger than my actual age. Now, the reason I'm writing you about my encounter, a few days ago, a large box arrived at my daughter's house that was addressed to me. The reason why it was sent to her address is a mystery. Also, there was no return address, and it was shipped from Oakland, California, which is the state where I live. My grandson brought the package to me, uh, a day or so later. Now, while he watched, I opened the box. It contained three missing books, the three missing books, and the framed photo of my parents that were missing the night of my encounter. There was also a battered shoe box that looked very familiar. When I opened the shoe box, there were a variety of small items, pens, buttons, coins, etc., that I realized I had lost at the same period at some period in my young life. That is when I revealed my experience with my astonished grandson. I'm still confused after receiving the package a few months ago. Who were these men and what did they want? Have you heard of a similar experience? If you have my permission to copy this email, I really need some answers. Thank you so much. Now I did talk to the witness or the experiencer I could say. Though I'm not sure what his thoughts were, uh, he remained quiet. I, I don't believe that he understands or believes in alien abduction. Were these men possibly men in black or extraterrestrials or one in the same? 
So this next account, an Ohio couple is walking home from the grocery store when they suddenly start to experience unexplained oddities, including strange acting people, sound changes, and lost time. My partner and I were walking home from the grocery store in October 2022. It's about six blocks from the store to our house along a busy street in our small Ohio city. As we were walking and chatting, we both observed two men smoking cigars on the side of the road. We passed by them and they both look at us. They started making weird comments that seemed aggressive. We both had the feeling it was somehow directed toward us. We don't, we don't look back and keep walking. At this point, we both realized everything was, had, has, excuse me, we both realize everything has gone very quietly and no cars are passing by. The cars up ahead aren't moving. We can hear music coming from a cafe at the end of the block. Then someone on the other side of the road that we can hear but not see is completely freaking out, screaming and going crazy. Everything felt so unsettling to both of us. And we commented on the quiet and how it was so odd. We reached the end of the block where the cafe is, and it's like we have been thrown into a wall of noise. We suddenly hear cars, and they all start moving past loudly. Bikes start going by, ringing bells, and basically all the city sounds come back in full force. It was so incredibly bizarre to go from this unnatural, settling, unsettling quiet to everything back to normal suddenly. We spoke about it and both experienced this in the exact same way. I also had an explicable feeling that we had been at a different time at that moment. Not sure why it was just the feeling. We walked home feeling a bit unsettled. We also passed two guys on the street who looked the same with messed up freaky and human faces that gave off extremely expressive vibes. We again had the same feeling of this isn't right. We got home and our son acted like we had been out for ages. I checked on my phone when we had checked out at the uh, grocery store and the walk that usually takes 10 minutes took over 30 minutes. I don't know what happened, but even a week later, I felt shaken by it. I actively avoided walking down the same block for two months. It seems so small, but we were totally freaked out by it. It's all just felt so wrong and sinister. Have you ever heard of similar experiences? I can't get it out of my head, and it's so weird that my partner and I experienced it all exactly the same way. Um, now, because of the time differential, I believe that the couple experienced a time slip or a glitch of some type. Um, difficult to determine when it occurred or happened multiple times. It's an odd account. But there are more to come. There was a teen and his family who were going deer hunting in the mountains of north central Pennsylvania. The witness was in a bog area when he observed a man dressed as a 16th century conquistador. Now, Burke, back in the night, early 1990s, during my early teens, my clan had headed into the north central mountains of Pennsylvania for the annual buck season. Most of us had never hunted in this area, but my dad and his brother, my uncle, had hunted here many years before, just one time. We had decided the night before opening day that we would hunt a remote area that required a hike of about two and a half miles back an old logging trail. Using topographical maps, everyone had decided where they would go once, and uh, we reached the end of the trail. My uncle and his son were headed up into a saddle slightly to the right and ahead of the trail end, while my other uncle and his two sons would spread out below the ridge on the right. 
my dad was headed to the left of a saddle of the saddle and my younger brother was headed to the left of the trail into a shallow hall i had chosen to head for a bog between my brother and dad when i had chosen that area the night before i had noticed a glance between my dad and uncle and I promised them that I would only skirt the edge. I knew better than to wander into a northern bog. Even a small bog like this one, approximately 80 to 100 yards, was dangerous. So we headed out after a hearty breakfast and hit the end of the logging road about half an hour or so before dawn. As we wished each other luck and split up, my dad looked at me and sternly said, Be careful in there, boy. I assured him that I would and headed for the bog. It was a dreary, misty morning with temps hovering just above freezing. The ground was wet, so moving through the forest was especially quiet. I figured I would angle in and hit the bog's edge at about midpoint and then still hunt the edge until I, I hit the midpoint on the other side. On the way in, as the woods slowly lit up with an overcast dawn, I slipped past a pair of squirrels, heard a woodpecker up on the ridge, and spotted a few chickadees. A blue jay spotted me, however, and sounded the alarm, which really upset me. It was a typical morning in the woods. Now, as I approached the edge of the bog, nature called, or more accurately, the heavy breakfast called, Reluctantly but hurriedly, I dug a small hole at the base of a huge hemlock, dropped my drawers, and proceeded to fertilize the tree. Now, as I squatted there, I realized that something had changed. Not only had the blue jay disappeared, but it seemed like everything else had as well. There wasn't a sound anywhere, and I had the unshakable feeling that I was being watched. Now, in my rather exposed and vulnerable condition, I tried to make myself smaller while at the same time scanning the woods around me and straining to hear the slightest rustle or twig snap. I fully expected to see one of two things, either a deer standing behind me or my brother or dad slipping between the trees trying to pull a practical joke on me. There was no one to be seen or heard, nothing. So all my focus had been behind me and to, the, and to either side, not ahead into the bog. No one in the right mind would be in there. But as I shifted my position slightly, I glanced straight into the desolate looking bog. There, next to a deadfall, approximately 30 to 35 yards out in the bog and staring right at me, was what appeared to be a torso and the head of a man. The rest was hidden behind brush and down trees between him and me. That alone would have been weird enough. What really shook me was his garb. He had a metal breastplate, breastplate and what looked like 16th century conquistador helmet on his head. My first thought was, okay, you're hallucinating. Your eyes are just playing tricks on you. I shifted position again and quickly finished my business, filled the hole with dirt, and stepped behind the tree. The whole time that being watched feeling never left, but I avoided looking back into the bog. Now, as I settled myself down, I began to work my way along the bog's edge, but slightly faster than I normally still, but than I normally still hunt. The woods remain eerily still, and then that feeling just wouldn't go away. Now, after I had gone about 30 yards, I ventured an, another look into the bog, and as I scanned through it, I slowly looked back towards where I thought I had seen the man. I easily picked out the deadfall, and sure enough, there standing to the left of it was the conquistador again. But he had shifted and was still staring right at me. Now, this time, I had the presence of mind to use my rifle scope and get a better look. And when the optics rested on where he should have been, there was nothing but a small dead bush 
back at the end of the deadfall. When I lowered the scope, there he was, and the bush was obscured. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my hands went clammy on me. I freaked. I made a beeline for the far end of the bog. There, just off the edge, was a small rise which I crested. It gave me a good view down into the dead standing and falling trees that littered the bog. I shifted around until I could pick out the deadfall again. There beside it was the man, and now I could see that he was holding something long in his hand, but I couldn't make out the detail. He was still staring directly at me, having shifted yet again. At that moment, a small break in the clouds opened in the sun to shine through the moment, and as it hit the area of the deadfall, it glinted brightly off the metal breastplate and the helmet. And then it was gone. It just vanished. The clouds closed again, but he was nowhere to be seen. So I left the bog and headed up the mountain to find my dad. He wasn't happy with me showing up so early, but when I told him what had happened, he stared me in the eyes for a few seconds and said, Bogs can be strange places, boy. He never mentioned it again, but I have no doubt that the reason he and my uncle had not come back here in a long, so long was because of that bog. I retold the story to the rest of the group later that night at the old hotel in which we were staying. No one laughed. The next day and for the rest of the trip, we hunted a different area. We never went back there. So this next account is local, happened recently. I live in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, about a half hour from where I work. I can get there going about five different ways. I usually take the most direct path because the other ways take me into Amish country and heavy deer traffic. Plus it's shorter, obviously. I pulled out of my driveway and the next thing I remember, I was pulling into a gas station in a town almost two and a half hours and six counties away in the opposite direction. I was literally in a town called Huntingdon, which is northwest of my home. I don't recall leaving the town where I live, driving the interstate or the sunrise that morning. I leave for work at about 5 a.m. It's still dark. The thing that creeps me out the most is the fact that, like I said, where it was well over 100 miles away from my house. What I want to know is how I got there in about an hour and a half. It was just after 6.30 a.m. I would have had to have driven through the heavy traffic during the morning, going well over 70 to 80 miles an hour at least, plus retained zero memory of it. That freaked me out so bad I called in and told them that I wasn't going to be there at work for health reasons and went to see my doctor that afternoon after returning home. I told the doctor my story, though I knew he didn't believe me. I'm young and Alzheimer's or dementia doesn't run in my family. The doctor did tell me I somehow hypnotized myself, which I, I don't understand. I brought up the incredible time I reached this destination and the towns I would have had to drive through to get there. He told me to slow down and take some time off work, but he didn't offer or suggest any help. Now, that was about a year ago, October 2022, and it hasn't happened since. But what really confuses me was the fact that it happened when there were several UFO sightings in the area. I even had relatives claim they saw weird lights in the sky. What are your thoughts? Now, I, I did call the witness and I talked to him. I'm confused as, as he is. I'm just as confused as he is. Um, he took a few photographs of Huntington with the timestamp and showed me the doctor's exam sheet he received. I believe what he's telling me, but uh, 
it's an incredible incident. Now, as far as the UFO sightings in Lancaster County area, there were a few mentioned in the local news around that period. I went back and checked it. So I don't know if it has anything to do with what happened to him or not. So this next account is a pair of Boulder uh, patrol agents are on an errand driving east on I-10 towards San Antonio, Texas. In need of gas, they pull off the highway and then enter a possible time slip. Now, I got this account from uh, my friends Kyle and Cam over Expanded Perspectives. So the witness states, back when I was a Border Patrol agent, I was sent out to El Paso, Texas to bring back a trail full of equipment in the middle of January. My partner Dave and I were on duty, but not in uniform since we had to load and unload the trail ourselves. We stashed our pitch pistols in our bags. We left, in, uh, we left El Paso en route to San Antonio and then Laredo. As the sun was going down about halfway between Fort Stockton and Sheffield, we were running low on gas, so we looked for a station. Not much out there. On the side of the road, we saw a sign that said, gas station, right before an exit. I pulled off I-10 and onto the, fe the feeder, which went up a hill and over an overpass. There was no side road, only one way to go. Now, once we were on the other side of I-10, the road became narrow. Just about one vehicle wide and it was in bad shape. Now, pulling the trailer, we had nowhere to turn around, so we we stayed on the road hoping the gas station was coming close. The road dead ended in a parking lot of a store. It looked like something out of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There were two pumps with a bulb hanging down at the end of an electric cord. There were older style pumps with numbered dials and no pay at the pump available. If not for the gas gauge sitting on empty, I would have turned around and left. Dave, my partner, said he'd fill up while I went in to pay. So I walked in the building, opened the door, stepped through, and froze. My hand automatically went to the spot where my holster would have been had I been in uniform. Now inside the store were five or six men mostly in overhauls, sitting in folded metal chairs around a black and white TV. The volume was way down. The picture looked as if it needed a better antenna. They all stared at me without so much as a word. Behind the counter was a skinny guy dressed in only his jeans, no shirt or shoes. He was wet, missing way too many teeth. I looked at the guys around the TV, then at the guy behind the counter, then back at the guys of the TV. I felt as if they were sizing me up for some nasty event soon. That small voice in the back of your head that tries to save you from time to time suggests that I should leave. Now I handed the guy behind the counter the government credit card and told him I wanted to fill the truck. He took the card and looked at it as if he didn't know what it was. Next, he reached under the counter and pulled out one of those old style credit card machines and the kind you ran back and forth to make an imprint of the raised numbers on the card. He had to look around for the uh, right forms to place in the machine. Now, just as he was handing me the receipt, Dave came through the door. He froze and saw his hand go, and I saw his hand go to the spot where his holster should have been. He backed out the door, and I followed him as quickly as I could without running. Now, once back on I-10, we talked about what we had just seen and what we thought we had run into. We talked it over a whole way to San Antonio. Now, a couple years later, my wife had to go to San Diego. And so as we were driving on I-10, we passed Sheffield, and I began looking for the exit. There was nothing even remotely like the overpass where we had used that night. Now, when I got home, I looked on MapQuest, MapQuest and, and Google Earth, but could find no trace of the overpass, the road, or the station. So 
So um, I ask, can a rift between being into another reality? So I received an interesting account that occurred in the vicinity of Baltimore, Maryland in June of 1992. The information was forwarded to me by a now retired attorney who continues to live in the area. Now, at the time of the incident, he, who I would refer to as MB, had a private practice with several offices in the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. metro area. He also provided uh, pro bono legal services for the state of Maryland, particularly representing clients with mental disabilities. Now, since retrieving the first email, or re since receiving the first email, I had two more conversations with MB, which were recorded with his permission. Now, I'm going to write his allegory as it was given to me. The resulting statement was approved by MB. Now, many of the specific and personal details won't be included for uh, MB's confidentiality and privacy. The statement uh, from MB was marked as Baltimore, Maryland, 4-5-2013. Now, he stated, in June 1992, I was assigned a pro bono case client who was being housed by court order in one of the state hospitals located in the Metro Baltimore area. I interviewed the client at the state hospital facility. I informed him that he was facing a weapon possession charge. And that was because he had a vintage Marlin Derringer handgun and ammunition were, was found in his pants pocket. And he had also had other local vagrancy violations. The client told me that he went by the name Morse Winthrop. He stated that he was from New Jersey and lived most of his life in New York City. The file showed that there was no record of him residing in the state of Maryland. Now, when arrested, Morris wore a high collar white shirt and a brown frock coat and pants. I examined the clothes. Later, I would discover that these were very similar to Victoria-era men's clothing from the 1970s to 80s. Excuse me, the 1870s to 80s. He also possessed a silver metal case, like a cigarette case. Inside the case was a uh, square piece of black colored material that resembled hard plastic. He was allowed to retain this object while at the facility. Morris looked to be in his early 30s, though there was, there was no hair or stubble on his face, just thin eyebrows. He had wispy blonde hair and a very pale complexion. His eyes were very deep blue, almost violet in color. Now, during the interview, he would look directly at me and smile. He answered a few questions other than uh, his, uh, he answered a few questions other than his name that he was living in New York City, and that he didn't know how he arrived in Baltimore. Now, a physician at the hospital stated that he may be suffering from shock and that there may be some memory loss. I didn't get that impression while in Morris's presence. It seemed to me that he knew exactly what was transpiring. To this day, I still do not know why I felt that way. Now, at the end of the interview, I told him that he was being held at the facility under court order and that I would seek a hearing date. Morris's reply to me was, thank you for your service. I will contact you, I promise. The next day I was contacted by the Baltimore County State Attorney's Office and then informed my, my services were no longer needed in the case and no other information was provided. I contacted the physician who was treating Morris. He stated that Morris was no longer at the facility. I asked where he was taken and told him that I would need to contact the state attorney's office. For almost two years, no official information was available regarding Morris. So in 1994, I was approached by an attendant who had worked in the state hospital during Morris's brief stay. 
I was told that Morris had suddenly disappeared from the ward after his late meal. There was a thorough search conducted, conducted without results. Morris's clothes were retained by the state's attorney's office. All other items, including the silver metal case, were missing. I had never found out where the, the weapon was stored, though I assume it is at state police headquarters. Now, at that time, I conducted a private search for Morris Winthrop. I hired a private investigator who found very little information other than, than that a single 32-year-old man named Morris Winthrop had resided in New York City in 1877 until he went missing without a trace. All his property in Manhattan had been left behind. The police found no evidence of foul play. After 19 years, I never found another reference to Morris Winthrop. This has become a bit of an obsession for me. I have hired other private investigators over the years, but nothing has been found. If Morris was a time traveler, I wonder if he'll contact me as he promised. Now, <clears throat> as I stated before, this is the uh, the final statement that was approved by MB. Now, could this be a case of time travel? I had to prefer, I, you know, I would prefer more information, but MB is quite wary of how others would interpret uh, his question to Morris's identity identity and disposition. He uh, asked me not to conduct a private inquiry. It seems his long-term investigation has ruffled the feathers of a few uh, state and local officials over the years. Now, my late friend and colleague, Rosemary Ellen Guiley, was intrigued with this account and later, in, uh, later included in one of her publications. So this is the last account for tonight. So if you have questions, please uh, post it in all caps in the chat. A young woman lives across the country from her family. Now, for some unknown reason, she is unable to contact her mother and communication with the family is compromised. Then something bizarre happens. When I was 22 and living across the country from my family, I tried to talk to my mother four or five times a week. After three months or so, she stopped answering her phone, so I called other people looking for her. My father didn't answer. My grandmother wouldn't talk to me. She said she was busy and just hung up, and no one else had heard from her. No one knew where she was. This lasted a few weeks, and I was starting to freak out. Then I got a message from someone about her estate and started crying. I called my dad over and over until he picked, he picked me up, started crying when he heard my voice, and then hung up on me. I kind of went into a trance because with no information, I had no idea what to do. I couldn't afford to fly home. I was living with someone and helping with the kids, so I, I couldn't just take off. And if she had been dead two weeks, I'd already missed the funeral. My family's faith mandates burial within 40 hours of the death. Then four days after the call with my dad, I was on the train going to work, and the car shook hard for a minute, then stopped, and the lights went out. A minute later, it started again. The lights came on, and off we went. But I thought someone must have moved because or the empty seat across from me had a person in it now. Then my phone rang. I answered without thinking because it was my mom's ringtone. And she freaked out immediately and started crying and talking frantically because I'd answer and she'd been trying to find me for two weeks. <laughs> That's a little strange. So folks, you got any questions, just put them up there. Uh, Wind Nyes, uh, I appreciate your... Uh, I appreciate your donation, much appreciated. No questions, folks?
Yeah, I, I can realize it's kind of hard to come up with questions for this type of subject. Uh, you know, it's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, Thomas Carroll asked, um, any cases of time moving backwards? Uh, you know, there are somewhat more rare. And the, the examples that I did have, and I did look for some, were were fairly mundane, so I didn't really mention much. I didn't, you know, I didn't put them as part of the presentation, but I do occasionally get them. Any other questions? Okay, well, I, I guess that's it. Oh, okay, Cans Quatch has one here. What do you think a glitch actually is? Well, I, I, for the most part, I think it's a time slip of some type. Either, either the witness themselves is going through some type of um, time slip through a portal, through some type of gateway, or it could be something that shows up inadvertently uh, from another time. Jose Sanchez. When he comes out, sees his wife as white as paper or hadn't seen him for hours. Bizarre. Yeah, it is, it is somewhat bizarre. It really is. You know, I, I, I like getting these. I like getting these accounts because they... Um, they, they always offer something different. I mean, you know, we I could talk, when I say glitch in the matrix, I could talk about a lot of different subjects uh, and, and uh, a lot of different occurrences. But, um, you know, the one I thought was the strangest was the conquistador. You know, that's, I had never heard anything even near that before. Uh, that was like almost a, um, a period time slip or so. And occasionally we do get those. Um, I, I had this was one instance that I reference a lot about a woman who had been walking her dog in a park in Seattle, Washington, where literally a saber tooth tiger showed up in the park right in front of. Um, it's weird. I mean, I don't think it was a flaw form or some type of topa, but I, I think something literally came through just for a brief period of time because it's disappeared quickly. Cap asked, what's the most recent sighting near you? Now, when you say sighting, what do you mean? I mean, I, I've had, if you're talking about overall sightings, we've been looking into several cryptic canine sightings near us. Uh, and we're involved in a few other uh, local, and when, when I say local, then a hundred miles radius uh, of uh, cryptic canines and other uh, cryptid sightings. And there's always seems to be something going on around here. Uh, I don't know what it is about this area, you know, with Gettysburg sitting right in the middle of it, it just seems like all the weirdness and strangeness is all around it. But uh, we do get a lot of weird sightings. Uh, Max Nemo, have you ever encountered any doppelganger accounts? We do get doppelganger accounts. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and, and put that in, in a future presentation. I get quite a few of them. Um, you know, I think most people have some type of doppelganger story where they... Um, Either someone sees, thinks they're seeing them and wonders why they didn't answer out to them when they called, or they, they see someone who looks just like them in another place, another area, and it's not them. I mean, it's a phenomenon that happens a lot. I mean, how many, how many people do we have? How many people have, you know, a twin or some somebody looks out there? You know, it's interesting. I had a, uh, my barber. 30 years ago, 
It's been a while because I was living in Maryland back then. He looked exactly like and sounded like Harrison Ford. No lie. I mean, he he was he was a splitting image of him. Uh, Robo 1776, has there ever been any follow-up on the Conquistador Bog? Maybe interview the dad. Uh, I, I didn't. I tried to get an interview with the father. No one would talk to me. The only thing I know is the bog was up in Potter County. For folks who know where Potter County is, that's in the north central part of the state. It's an area where there's a lot of hunting. Uh, Verpine, do you think the Velociraptor or many T-Rex sightings in the Four Corners in Texas are time slips or cryptids? You know, it's hard to tell. You know, we've had, there's a lot of weird things that happen in the Four Corners area. Uh, I think there may be some, some time slips, but I think there are also some actual flesh and blood cryptids there. Um, we get a lot of, we get a lot of these many dinosaur sightings in um, southern Texas as well. Uh, I don't know what they are. Um, but we do have quite a few reports about them. So uh, maybe I'll do a show on those one day. Uh, B-Cab asks, have you had any reports of Bigfoot wearing clothing? Oh, God, let's see. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, I had one in, uh, actually it was in Lancaster, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. It was an Amish farmer and on his land where a Bigfoot had come into his, around his homestead and, the, and this thing was wearing clothes. It was the strangest thing. And this, this, this Bigfoot also, according and it, this was secondhand because I didn't talk directly to the witness. I talked to the guy who used to come on the farm and, and pick up milk. Uh, he used to pick the milk up and, and take it to the dairy. Uh, this this Amish farmer talked to him about it, and he told he told him that when this uh, this Bigfoot was walking towards the the barn, it literally disappeared. It vanished. I had to dig that one out one day. Uh, uh, Robo1776, thanks for the uh, your donation. It's much appreciated. Uh, wing seam. Next time I email, won't drink as much beforehand. Or Okay, bud, question, love the show. <laughs> Look forward to it. Yeah, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, folks. Well, I want to thank each and all of you for uh, watching and chatting. Uh, if you donate, it's truly appreciated. Your uh, support's what makes all this possible. So please like, subscribe, and share. If you have an account, be considered for the show or for the blog. You can uh, forward to my email at lawnstricker at famsandmonsters.com. So uh, I want to thank you for coming on again. And uh, next week, I'll, I'll try to, I'll, I, I might pull up doppelganger uh, accounts and maybe something different. Like I said, if you have a suggestion, I'm always open for suggestions. So if you uh, use my email, lawnstrickler at famsandmonsters.com and, and send, uh, send it to me, I'll uh, do what I can. So until next week, you all take care and you have a nice weekend. Talk soon.